My name is Dian Öby Johansen, and I am Associate Professor at the Center for European Law at the University of Oslo. In this video, I will give you a very brief introduction to European Union law. The European Union, or the EU, is a union of 27 European states, colored in dark blue on the map. It was first established as the European Coal and Steel Community, which consisted of only six states, on the 18th of April 1951, more than 70 years ago. It then evolved to become the European Community, the purpose of which was to establish an internal market with free movement of goods, workers, services and capital. And in 1994, this internal market was expanded to the countries colored in green on the map, Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein, by the virtue of the EEA agreement. And today, the European Union is more than just an internal market. Since the last major treaty reform in 2010, the Union has wide-ranging competences, also in, for example, the fields of criminal law and procedure, asylum and migration, civil procedure, and foreign and security policy. It is, in other words, no longer a merely economic union. It is jokingly said that the European Union is the lawyer's revenge over the economists and the political scientists. And this is not entirely without merit, as the EU is often perceived as a project of integration through law. The foundation of the EU legal system, the primary law, is its constitutive treaties, the Treaty on European Union, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, and the Charter on Fundamental Rights. In practice, these treaties function as a constitution of the Union and its legal system. The treaties can only be amended by unanimous agreement between the parties or masters of the treaties, namely the EU member states. It follows that, despite its federation-like design, the Union is not a federal state proper. It still remains a creature of public international law, an international organization based on treaties between its member states. EU secondary law is enacted by the Union's institutions. The two key normative instruments of general application that make up EU secondary law is regulations and directives. They essentially constitute EU legislation and but take effect domestically in two different manners. Regulations are analogous to federal legislation. They are binding in their entirety and shall be directly applicable in the domestic law of all 27 EU member states. Directives, on the other hand, are not directly applicable, but have to be transposed into domestic law by domestic authorities. And they are binding as to the result to be achieved, meaning that the provisions of a directive may give room for national adaptation. For example, a directive regulating a specific product may lay down minimum safety requirements so that each member state may choose whether or not to enact a stricter requirement. The modern tendency in EU law, though, is that more and more legislation is enacted through regulations rather than through directives. For example, the former Data Protection Directive was replaced by the now infamous GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. So in what fields does the Union have the competence to legislate? That is laid down in the first few articles of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, the TFEU. In some areas, the Union has exclusive competence, notably with regard to customs, European competition law and international trade. In these areas, member states cannot act on their own at all. In most areas where the Union has competence, however, it shares that competence with the member states. This is true, for example, with regard to the internal market, the environment, transport, energy and asylum. That a competence is shared means that both the Union and the Member States may act, for instance through legislation. However, the Member States can only act in an area if the Union has not already done so. In practice, this has the effect that Union law gradually replaces domestic law in areas of shared competence. Finally, the Union has some supplementary competences. Areas in which the Union may only support, coordinate or supplement the actions of the Member States without thereby encroaching on the competences of the Member States.
the competences of the union are exercised by its institutions. And in the legislative process, the key players are the Council, the Commission and the European Parliament. The Council is composed by representatives of the Member States and acts as legislator, usually in combination with the European Parliament. And the Parliament is directly elected by the citizens of the Union. The Commission is composed by commissioners, one appointed by each member state, but acting in personal capacity. In the legislative process, the Commission has the right of initiative. The Commission also has many executive tasks, since its primary objective is to be the guardian of the treaties. Moreover, EU law is interpreted and applied by the Court of Justice of the European Union, often in close cooperation with domestic courts which may refer cases to the Court of Justice in order to get an authoritative interpretation of union law. Finally, the European Union is composed of also two other institutions, the European Central Bank and the Court of Auditors. When the institutions of the Union create and implement union law, they have to follow certain key principles of union law. First, since the Union is an international organization and not a state, it only has those powers that are conferred upon it from its member states. To act, the Union must thus have been conferred the necessary competences to do so. Second, according to the principle of subsidiarity, the Union shall use its non-exclusive competences only if the objectives of the proposed action cannot be sufficiently achieved by the member states themselves. This has important practical consequences. For example, the Commission waited to propose maximum prices for mobile data roaming until after it became abundantly clear that the issue could not be resolved without union action. Third, all union action is subject to the principle of proportionality. No union act must go beyond what is necessary to attain the objectives of the treaties. Fourth and finally, if the union has acted by enacting legislation, it shall have supremacy over domestic law. And from a legal perspective, supremacy, coupled with the doctrine of direct effect, is of particular importance. Therefore, let us spend a few more moments on supremacy and direct effect, so that we better understand how these key principles operate across the Union. According to Union law, provisions of the treaties, as well as provisions of regulations and directives, shall have direct effect in domestic law provided that the provision in question is clear and unambiguous, unconditional, and that its operation must not be dependent on further action. That a provision has direct effect means that individuals should be able to invoke it directly before domestic authorities, regardless of whether the provision in question has been transposed into domestic law. Moreover, provisions of union law have supremacy over conflicting domestic legislation. So, these two doctrines combined give individuals the opportunity to challenge domestic legislation that conflicts with union law directly before domestic courts. And this has been a key factor in the development and actual implementation of union law. That said, we must remember that the EU member states remain sovereign. The doctrines of direct effect and supremacy are technically speaking merely duties for the member states to enact the necessary constitutional and legislative measures to ensure such effects in their domestic legal systems. And how this duty to ensure direct effect and supremacy is implemented by the EU member states varies. Some, such as the Netherlands, have a monist legal order, meaning that no particular adaptations are necessary. Others, like Germany, have implemented union law en bloc through a provision of its constitution. And Denmark has done the same, but at the level of domestic legislation. What they all have in common, though, is that the effects of union law, including the doctrines of direct effect and supremacy, are ensured by domestic provisions that implement union law en bloc. I will end this video with a brief introduction to interpretation of union law, which poses some particular challenges. The authoritative interpreter of union law is the Court of Justice of the European Union, whose great hall of justice we see before us on the screen. It is the CJEU's interpretative methodology we have to emulate in order to arrive at a correct interpretation of union law. As illustrated by this excerpt from TFEU Article 28 on customs, union law is multilingual. 
Textual interpretation is therefore a challenge. According to the CJU's famous Silfit judgment, one must in principle compare all different language versions. Since there is today 24 official languages, that is practically impossible. Moreover, even when the language versions are in accordance with one another, one must take into account that Unilaw uses a particular and autonomous terminology. So for these reasons, textual interpretation is difficult and rarely sufficient. Each provision has to be interpreted in its context and, importantly, in light of its purpose. And, in contrast to what is common in, for example, the Norwegian legal system, preparatory works carry very little legal weight when interpreting union law. Indeed, often preparatory work is simply unavailable. That is usually the case for primary law, but also when it comes to secondary law, the preparatory work tends to be incomplete because political compromises are often made between the Commission, Council and Parliament at the very end of the process without any proper explanations of the changes made to the text being recorded. Thus, even where you have some preparatory work, one must be very careful on relying on it. And in practice, preparatory work is often made redundant by the increasingly expansive preambles of directives and regulations. Thus, Due to the vagueness inherent in multilingualism and the lack of preparatory works, a teleological style of interpretation is often adopted. When faced with several possible interpretations based on text and context, the CJU tends to choose the interpretation that best realizes the object and purpose of the instrument in question. The purpose of a directive or a regulation will often be stated in its preamble or in its introductory articles. In addition to these specific purposes, EU primary law sets out certain general purposes that the union law seeks to achieve, such as the establishment of an internal borderless market for goods, services, persons and capital. Moreover, the CJEU often justifies expansive interpretations driven by teleological reasoning by referring to the need to ensure the effectiveness of EU law. Effet utile. Finally, a few words on the relevance and weight of the case law of the Court of Justice when interpreting and applying union law. Now, anyone who wishes to get a good grasp of union law must engage with case law. Indeed, the CJU generally follows its own precedents and it cites its own case law extensively in its judgments. And it's only very rarely that it departs from its own jurisprudence, although when it does, it tends not to do so explicitly. And through the union's history, the Court of Justice has been a key driver of integration, making extensive use of teleological reasoning and appeals to effectiveness in order to achieve the lofty goals of European integration. It does seem fitting to end our lightning introduction to union law here in the grand staircase of the CJU. Thanks for watching.